a very good uh, morning to you all. Welcome uh, to the Burkitts and CLA web, uh, webinar. Design, fund and build a development. To set this in context, uh, we've had a number of clients, uh, increasing number of clients over the uh, uh, last few years who have been considering their own uh, development um, and they've been sort of uh, coming to us looking for pointers as to how to go about it. Um, it made sense to put together a webinar um, to uh, present some ideas and provide uh, clients referred with some key legal pointers. Thank you very much to the CLA for joining us. Um, we're very appreciative of Alison Provis, um, who's joining us. Um, and Alison is going to be providing uh, information with regard to uh, design in the planning context. We're expecting to uh, speak for about 45 minutes, followed by 15 minutes of questions and answers. Uh, you have a chat box on your screen. Um, do please send in questions as we go, um, and we will endeavour to answer as many as we can at the end. There is a feedback um, form which uh, you will be provided with after the event, um, and we would be very grateful if you would fill it in. Um, any pointers, uh, good or bad, um, are really useful. Um, as our suggestions for other seminars and webinars. Hopefully soon we'll be back in uh, the real world, but uh, I expect there'll probably be a mix of uh, online and uh, physical um, webinars and seminars. Um, we look forward to it. For the uh, speakers today, um, we're being joined um, uh, by Tom Newcomb, Head of Planning. Tom will lead off. Um, and set a development in the planning context. He will then be followed by Alison Provis from the CLA, um, who, as I said, is going to focus on um, mainly design pointers, um, but also set those, the design of a development into the planning context. Following Alison uh, is Alex Schaffmer. Alex is head of our um, uh, property finance division. Um, and Alex is going to provide a bit of insight into the uh, uh, legal aspect of obtaining funding. Last, but by no means least, Stefan Harris-Wright, head of our construction team, will provide us with um, uh, some pointers about procurement, um, aspects of appointments, uh, warranties, but also then tie the talk back into the funding aspects, which Alex will have introduced and Steph will wind up with. We'll follow that up with um, a question and answer session. Um, so as I say, please uh, do send in your feedback. At this point, um, I would like to hand over to Tom, um, who will uh, uh, hopefully uh, provide us with some um, planning pointers. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk to you uh, relatively briefly in relation to the planning process. Um, Alison will will sort of handle the, the the majority of the of the planning aspects of this presentation. Um, and I've only really got one slide, which is in front of you now, uh, which looks quite complicated and and yet is not even the full picture by any means of how the planning system works and the kind of pathways that have to be operated to get a, a planning permission, which in the context of the, of the sort of developments we have in mind this morning, uh, you're almost certainly going to need. Um, the, um, as I say, the planning system is complicated. It also changes uh, really quite regularly, and not only that, uh, quite fundamentally at times. And we are um, on the cusp of one of those times at the moment, and there'll be more to that, more on that uh, later on in relation to the planning white paper, and indeed the uh, Queen's speech yesterday. Um, what we have on this slide, the top, um, the top line is um, what you might, in, this is in blue, is, is what you might employ a promoter to do for you in terms of the larger sites, uh, getting, your, getting your site allocated through the development plan process, whether that is uh, via a local plan or indeed 
possibly in relation to a neighbourhood plan and going through the neighbourhood plan process. Um, for the purposes of, of, of what we're really considering, we're, we're thinking about um, landowners, and I know we've got many of you on the call, um, looking at doing this themselves and looking at a, at a relatively modest development, but taking it through from start to finish, in, including the, the planning, the design, the funding and the building. So really, we're talking about the, the orange line through the middle. And I think the key point to probably make is, is, is first off, the, the four red boxes, there are different types of planning permission that one can obtain. You can have a full permission, which has got all of the details. Uh, and once once granted, you get a set of conditions. And um, once you've discharged those, then you can start on site. Um, you can have an outline consent and then a series of reserved matters that need to be applied for in due course. Uh, you have a longer period of time within which to implement that consent. You can have a hybrid consent where part of your site might be full and part of it might be outlined with reserve matters to come. And then you can have a, um, a relatively new thing called a permission in principle with then technical details consent to follow. That hasn't been taken up particularly well nationwide. It doesn't appear to be uh, have many advantages over an outline and reserve matters approach. Once you've decided which route you want to take, um, usually there will be a pre-application stage before you actually submit your designs to the council for validation, first of all, then consultation. And then there may well be some amendments and there'll certainly be some reporting that needs to be done at, uh, at local authority uh, before a decision is actually made. And that decision can either be made uh, a delegated decision by an officer or um, it will go to committee. If the, if the scheme is uh, sufficiently important, it can at that stage be called in by the Secretary of State for the Secretary of State to determine it. And then following that decision making process, you um, will either have an approval, in which case you're likely or you will almost certainly have at least two conditions, but you may well have many more than that appended to your planning permission. You are likely to have a Section 106 agreement, which will deal with the delivery of affordable housing, on-site infrastructure like open space and um, SUDs, et cetera. And then um, depending on where you are in the country, you may well also have a community uh, infrastructure levy charge, which is akin to a kind of tax, which is payable to the local planning authority based on the amount of additional floor space that you've created. That decision can be subject to judicial review or if you were unsuccessful and it was re refused, then you have the opportunity to appeal. And um, the decision of that appeal, again, will either be an approval or a refusal, and you've got the opportunity to make a statutory challenge. So as a quick whiz through as to how it all works, it is quite complicated, but there is a route through that is perfectly possible for you to do yourselves, and indeed many, many people do. Um, and so, um, I think that's probably a, a flavour of to how the planning process works and maybe we can pick up um, at the end for some questions but I will hand over to Alison to talk a bit more detail about planning and in particular design. That's great, thanks ever so much Tom, that's perfect. So um, thanks ever so much to Burkitt for inviting the CLA to join this morning, um, we very much appreciate it so thank you ever so much. As Jeremy said, my name is Alison Provis and I am a regional surveyor with the CLA based in the eastern region out of our new market office and I'm here this morning to talk to you through the design uh, uh, element of it. Um, it is a big topic as you might imagine as uh, Tom sort of alluded to, uh, it can be quite complicated the planning process so my presentation will touch on some of the points that you need to think about but there will certainly be um, sort of wider elements as well which I won't have time to cover this morning. So really just wanted to sort of set the scene, design is very much coming to the fore in terms of planning policy, there's been lots of research and reports uh, done on the impact of poor design but also the benefits of good design as well, some of which I'll come on to later. But you know why would you want to be doing your own development? Well firstly you, you can retain control over the quality and design for example, um, if you retain it and you don't sell the units then you can diversify your business interests um, and also you can benefit from the uplift in land value that the scheme uh, generates. So I just wanted to start with government policy really just to set the scene as to the direction of uh, government policy uh, and the direction it's traveling and the impact that might have on planning and development schemes. So as we know uh, the government are committed uh, for net zero emissions by 2050 
you've hopefully uh, are aware of the minimum energy efficiency standards uh, for domestic and commercial property which have been announced uh, and continue to be consulted on. We've got the concept of biodiversity net gain uh, which was introduced through the 25 year environment plan um, and then the environment bill. Connectivity is obviously um, a major element. So the Queen's speech this week, we heard that 5G mobile networks, uh, gigabit broadband provision were being prioritised. And then ultimately we do have the planning um, proposals coming through. So last year we had the planning white paper released. Um, earlier this year we had the MPPF consultation, which I'll come on to in a moment. And then again on Tuesday we had the planning bill and the Queen's speech as well. So just moving on to national planning policy and guidance, if I start with the NPPF, the National Planning Policy Framework, this is the um, government's uh, policy uh, direction which all local planning authorities uh, should be creating local plans to um, tie in with. First point to note is that it should be read as a whole. Uh, there are various chapters throughout um, and all sections, sections are interdependent on each other. So you can't sort of cherry pick um, those sections which support your uh, proposal and ignore those that don't. It's sort of to be read as a whole document. The second point to note about it is um, the uh, overall sort of principle, uh, which is a presumption in favour of sustainable development, which is under paragraph 11 of the MPPF. So this, uh, this principle um, states that for applications uh, for the Planning Commission, they're to be determined in line with up-to-date uh, development plans, so uh, local plans from local authorities, unless material planning considerations suggest otherwise. But for decision making, it does state that where a local plan uh, is silent or relevant policies are out of date, that permission should be granted um, unless NPPF policies suggest otherwise or there are adverse uh, impacts which, which outweigh the benefits. Just coming on to the National Design Guide, this was planning practice guidance, which was released by MHCLG back in January and is available um, on the gov.uk website. And I'll come on to more detail uh, on that in a moment. Just also wanted to mention uh, the MPPF, uh, which was consulted on earlier this year, together with the National Model Design Code. So uh, this consultation was released to incorporate a number of recommendations that were made to the government by the Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission. So this commission was set up to look at this exact topic, design and uh, development schemes, and they released a Living uh, with Beauty report last year, which the government have reviewed, and they've now incorporated some of those recommendations uh, into these two documents. So, for example, the MPPF, some of the changes that they've introduced uh, is a focus from the built environment to places, um, a beauty, design, uh, quality and placemaking uh, themes running throughout the document, and also making it clearer that poor quality schemes should be refused. In terms of the National Model Design Code, um, there's an expectation that uh, local authorities will create design codes to um, inform development um, and its design, and uh, this code has been consulted on um, sort of is uh, aiming to provide local authorities with that guidance um, that they need to be creating those design codes. <coughs> so from the National Design Guide, I just wanted to pick out this infographic because um, I think it's a 60 odd page document, uh, which it sounds quite lengthy, but fundamentally uh, it revolves around this infographic here. So these three key themes of climate, character and community and then we've got those 10 elements within it, um, which the uh, document refers to quite uh, in a lot of detail. And also very helpfully, it does refer back to um, chapters in the MPPF, uh, which support those 10 elements. So it sounds quite lengthy, but it is quite easy to sort of read through and digest um, with help references back to the MPPF. So I'd certainly recommend um, having a look at that. Just moving on to uh, local planning uh, policy. So uh, the first place to start with local planning policy is the local plan, which, as I say, uh, the MPPF um, policy should be incorporated in that. So the first thing to sort of understand is what, um, where your site lies, really, and what designations and policies might be um, applicable to it. There should be a proposals map on the uh, local planning authority website, which you can have a look at and download, which can um, help you understand that. And then sort of moving on to the sort of uh, process, uh, all planning applications uh, are decided by reference to local plan policies and uh, the burden of uh, proof. So supporting the application with reports and surveys um, is does lie with the applicant. 
Um, so it's up to uh, you to support your uh, proposals with the relevant evidence, reports and things like that, which you need to, to, to persuade the officer to give you permission ultimately. Um, it can be that perhaps if you don't provide those reports or those surveys um, with the application, then um, the officer doesn't have all the information they need to make an informed decision and they therefore might find it easier to, to, to refuse permission. So it's important to make sure that you know what reports are needed at the outset and, and submit those. Um, the planning application should address all of the relevant local plan policies uh, which affect the development, some of which I've listed there, but there will um, be more depending on what you're proposing. And then obviously, uh, as Tom was saying on the housing side, um, there, depending on again on the scale of your proposal, there could be an affordable housing element. So it's important to just know what that is uh, for your local authority and address that accordingly. Just uh, moving on to uh, neighbourhood plans, again, uh, something that Tom mentioned, these are a material planning consideration. Uh, some parishes do have them, some don't. Uh, so just um, check yours out and see whether you do have one that's been adopted and um, is relevant or not. Um, if one is being drafted or uh, your community is thinking about one, it can be an opportunity um, to become involved. Um, in the drafting because uh, it can be um, a time where you can submit sites for allocation uh, for housing or for green spaces and access and things like that so it can be an opportunity for people. Other opportunities uh, again coming back to this principle of a presumption in favour of sustainable development under paragraph 11 of the MPPF um, the five-year housing land supply, so uh, under the MPPF, a uh, local planning authority is required um, to have one of these um, and provide an annual position statement as to their five-year supply. And if uh, an authority is unable to demonstrate they have a five-year supply, um, then paragraph 11 does come in and that can be an opportunity um, to uh, allocate sites um, at the annual statement. The housing delivery test, uh, so this measures net additional uh, dwellings provided in a local planning authority area against homes required and um, from this year if the uh, delivery is less than the 75% requirement then paragraph 11 applies again. And also just coming on to the status of local plans, so depending on uh, where your local plan has got to uh, that determines the weight it carries in terms of decision making. So for example it could be MPPF compliant and bang up to date um, or it could be at an um, examination stage perhaps where it's been submitted to the Secretary of State uh, or it could be in a um, data collection uh, sort of consultation stage. So depending on where your local plan is um, that can offer opportunities um, again under paragraph 11. Just moving on to some other considerations which you might like to think about in terms of a development uh, designations. So it's important to understand uh, if any of these um, might apply to your site because that can impact uh, and sort of dictate what you can and can't do. Um, if there's just a buildings in the vicinity or if you're in the green belt, etc., um, that can be a problem. So just make sure you understand that. Um, and then it's just important to think about what objectives you're um, looking to achieve. So, you know, are you wanting to maximize financial return? leave a legacy perhaps and then once you've thought about that doing the necessary assessments to make sure that your proposals um, match in uh, with, with what you're looking to do. Just wanted to flag costs because these can run away with you quite quickly if you're not careful uh, so it's always recommended to have a budget at the outset and, and obtain fee quotes from those consultants and professionals you're looking to um, involve in your scheme. Um, but also to include a contingency element because um, there could be problems, for example, with the site that you uncover once you've broken ground, which you weren't expecting, or uh, the uh, local planning authority can raise issues, uh, which again can um, impact on costs. Just a few practical considerations that you might like to think through. Um, so the two I wanted to flag specifically were timings, uh, was particularly for ecology surveys. Some of them can only be done at certain times of year. So just make sure you understand that and what you need to be doing when to make sure that you don't inadvertently delay your development for any reason. Um, and access for surveys, uh, particularly if the site is uh, tenanted, just making sure that you have that provision under the agreement to obtain access. Uh, there was a high court case uh, relatively recently with a landlord uh, where that was a problem. So just make sure um, that you're um, OK on that. Also with a scheme, depending on how uh, uh, the scale of it and, and uh, the nature of it, the number of um, sort of professionals or consultants you need to involve um, can be quite vast. So it can range from planning consultants and surveyors uh, to accountants and obviously lawyers, architects, highways, ecology, um, hydrology perhaps. 
So it's just important to make sure that um, you know who you need um, and the relevant surveys you need as well. So just moving on to the land and legacy um, placemaking side of things. Um, so this is becoming an increasing um, focus for lots of landowners. And I think this uh, quote here from the Princess Foundation for Building Community is uh, a really lovely way of explaining land and legacy. And um, for those of you interested, uh, you might be familiar with the Princess Foundation, the work they've been doing. There's many, many reports on the website, uh, which you can download and read through on this exact topic. And this particular one here, A Landowner's Guide to Popular Development, um, is very interesting. It has 14 principles um, listed there, which it covers, and it's um, well worth a read if this, um, if this space is interesting to you. Um, a few other considerations in relation to placemaking. Again, the Princess Foundation have released uh, the Beauty in My Backyard Toolkit. So this is a free online toolkit, um, which uh, through three workshops, you can create a housing manual to directly influence quality and design of your new housing development. And it does um, embed those 14 principles and other key planning considerations which you need to be thinking about. So well worth checking out if that's of interest. Just moving on to the destinations principle. So um, placemaking is about sort of creating, uh, well, not having one dimensional areas. So, you know, just a work environment, for example. It's about creating a space that works for people to work in, live in, socialize in, exercise in, etc. So this is about sort of creating um, cafes, green spaces, walks, uh, and also introducing complementary businesses um, for those uses uh, and also health and well-being so yoga studios and things like that and again uh, the princess foundation has done a lot of work and research in relation to that concept just some future trends that might be directing placemaking going forward uh, obviously over the last 18 months we've had covid and working from home has become the norm so uh, you know we'll we be seeing people doing half and half or you know more working from home than previously in which case you know will innovation that we've seen in the workplace have to come back to a residential setting perhaps Connectivity, again, that's um, become increasingly uh, important over the last 18 months or so, um, and you know, going forward uh, will only be more and more important. But fundamentally, the green agenda will be what is directing placemaking going forward um, and sustainability. So that will be something to, um, to very much be thinking about. Just moving on to uh, CLA advice. So we have a couple of handbooks which are available to purchase uh, in relation to some of the things I've been talking about. Um, as I say, I haven't had a chance to cover everything uh, in this presentation this morning, but the Landowner's Guide to Rural Housing Development that we've recently released um, covers what I've been speaking about, plus a lot more. And then obviously we have a, um, a planning uh, handbook there as well. We do also have a webinar available to purchase on biodiversity net gain as well, which is available, and also uh, on our YouTube channel, a placemaking uh, webinar as well, which we held. So um, thank you ever so much. And I will now pass over to Alex to talk about funding. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Um, so talking about funding, when thinking about financing your build, your obvious first port of call is to think about who to borrow from. There are a range of lenders in the market, some of which are very keen on development finance and do a lot of it um, to some lenders who weren't touched at all. You might find, therefore, that going to the lender you normally bank with may not be the best route for you um, or they may not even be willing to consider funding it. However, going to a lender that you have a relationship with already is obviously a good starting point as they may be able to take a more relaxed view on the lend and the terms of it. That aside, it's always important to look at different options. And as I say, there are a range of lenders in the market who will consider development finance. The least expensive lenders to borrow from are, of course, the high street lenders. So Lloyds Bank, um, Barclays, Santander, those sort of types of lenders. Um, and Lloyds Bank is one of the lenders I see most active in the development um, arena. Um, and uh, these sorts of lenders um, will have quite strict criteria for borrowing from them. So um, they will expect the gross uh, development value to be below a certain level. They might, might require some sort of track record in development, those sorts of things. Um, the other more expensive lenders, and by expensive I mean that they will charge a higher interest rate and multiple fees, will, but will be more flexible on criteria, um, are uh, the sort of alternative lenders. Um, 
And um, over the last year, particularly with lockdown and the effect of COVID and the introduction of the C-bills loans, we've seen a lot of activity in this end of the market, with lenders like Oak North being particularly active. So um, what will your lender want from you? Um, so the first thing is that you will receive is a, a heads of terms or term sheet, which will be a sort of single page or a couple of page um, pages of a document which sets out the key commercial terms of the lend. It's really important at this stage to make sure that you're happy with those terms um, because they will have to have credit approval before they can offer you the loan on those terms and if you then later on want to change the terms it could delay things if you have to go back to credit. So what documents will they expect you to sign? Well, there'll be a suite of documents and the first one will obviously be the loan agreement, which deals with the terms of the money being lent to you. And there will be, of course, a legal charge over the land. If you're running the builds for a company, they might expect a debenture, which is essentially a general security document that creates fixed and floating security over all of the assets which are in that company, including the land. Um, and they may ask for security over shares in that company. And a lot of alternative lenders also ask for personal guarantees. Sometimes those are limited to a certain amount, um, but, um, but sometimes they're not. Um, what you'll also see them ask for is copy of the key construction documents and appointments. So usually the appointment of the building contractor, the structural engineer and the architect are the things that they're most keen on seeing. And indeed, they might want to have an assignment of the rights under those contracts. But I'll leave Stefan Harris Wright to talk about that in a bit more detail. Each lender has its own forms of documents that it uses, and they all vary in their terms. With all loans, interest will be charged on the loan, and there is usually almost always an arrangement fee. Interest is sometimes rolled up and is um, part of the money that is borrowed so that you don't have to finance it month to month during the build. For alternative lenders, there are usually a number of extra fees on top. So there might be an exit fee, a payment for when the loan is repaid, whether it's paid early or paid on time. Uh, sometimes there are non-utilisation fees. So if you don't borrow the money straight away, essentially the lender is losing money and not receiving interest as interest is on money that's actually borrowed. Um, and they can't use the funds elsewhere as they've committed to you. So they charge a fee for that. You also see other sorts of fees like document fees and things like that. You can sometimes see what's called an interest make whole or interest coupon. Essentially, it means that if you repay the loan early, you still have to pay interest as if the money had been borrowed for a certain length of time. It may not be for the full length of, of the period that they were initially intending to lend to you, um, but it will be for a period longer than, than the repayment that you, that you were doing. Um, the reason that they have this is that um, so you don't finance with an alternative lender and then ditch them the moment you can get your hands on cheaper financing. The only thing to bear, the other thing to bear in mind in relation to costs is that um, in these types of transactions is that it's normal for the borrower to bear all the costs and expenses incurred by both sides. So the valuation costs will be for the cost of the borrower, but also the legal fees of the lenders. And you need to factor this in when planning your finances. Um, and the other thing to think about is timing. Most lends for a development finance take about four to six weeks to put in place. This is because the lender will need to get the valuation done and will usually do due diligence on the property, which will be conducted by the lawyers and their lawyers and comes in the form of a report that's often re referred to as a report on title or a certificate of title. A report on title and a certificate of title um, are very similar things, but they are slightly different. A certificate of title is literally just a statement about the, what the title is, who owns the property and what issues there are. A report on title is the same thing, but then goes one step further and basically um, recommends to the lender what they should do in relation to any issues, how to resolve them. So take out insurance or something like that. Um, a lot of lenders use the terms certificate of title and report on title interchangeably, but what they mean is a, a report on title, even if they are um, um, talking about a um, certificate of title. 
Uh, in order to do a report on title, searches will need to be done at various registers, and some of these, depending on where the property is located, can take weeks. So this is something that needs to be done as soon as possible when the lender is agreed to lend. However, do note, uh, there's no point in getting searches done on your own beforehand as they expire, and most lenders won't accept searches that are more than a certain age, so usually three months, but sometimes up to sort of four or six. If you want to get your transaction done quicker, uh, you can, if your lender agrees, um, get insurance to cover the lack of searches, but obviously this costs money, and um, but it can move things along. The other thing on time to bear in mind is that most lenders need to get credit approval before they can start. And as I mentioned earlier, um, if you significantly change um, the transaction, uh, then they may well have to go back to credit and this can take time. Um, what a lot of people do with development finance is use a more expensive bridging lender whilst they do the initial build. And then once things have progressed and the property is at first fix, then they can re uh, refinance with a less expensive lender. Um, one word of warning I want to make, um, and I raise this as I had a borrower last year who came a cropper with this, is that if you can, please try to avoid on-demand loans. An on-demand loan is where the lender says the loan is on demand and they can ask for the money back at any time. The loan may contain all sorts of criteria about when they can ask for the money back. So if you breach the documents, you go insolvent, those sorts of things. But if it contains an on-demand provision, that essentially trumps everything else. And this gets particularly unpleasant where you've signed up and paid a big arrangement fee or signed up to a make whole, interest make whole, um, and there's effectively nothing to stop them from deciding the following week, having received your your, pet, um, your fees, um, to ask for the money back. Now, obviously, that's not something that lenders usually go around doing because it would be incredibly bad for their reputation. Um, but it's not impossible. And I indeed had a client contact me last year as he borrowed some money to do a development of a property. Um, and um, he had planning permission, and everything else. But when he went to start the development, uh, the property was um, situated right on the border with a neighbouring property and the neighbour didn't want him to do the development. So was refusing to allow him to put scaffolding on, on his neighbouring property, which was necessary in order to get it in place to do, do the development. And this had delayed the whole process for a number of months whilst they were sort of arguing over this. Um, and the lender had decided that they didn't want to finance the lend anymore and they saw it now as risky. Um, and so they were they were pulling pulling the lend and asking for the money back. Um, and uh, the borrower contacted me saying could they really ask for the money back and that he'd paid you know over a hundred thousand pounds in arrangement fees um, to borrow the money and um, and I had to tell him that yes, unfortunately that was the situation. I have to add, I didn't advise them on their original borrowing, otherwise I would have pointed that out. So, um, so yes, that's a cautionary tale. So, in short, um, expect the lend to take a while to put in place. Do shop around for lenders, and if you can go with a high street lender, um, that will be cheaper for you. Expect alternative lenders to be more expensive and um, expect to pay quite a few fees with them. And if you can, avoid on-demand loans. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Stephen Harris-Wright um, to discuss the construction side. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thanks very much, Alex. Um, I'm going to be talking to you about uh, construction considerations uh, in the context of designing, funding and building your own development. So thinking about the context of having got planning, having got funding in principle, and then moving ahead to think about how you're going to structure the construction elements of the scheme. So in summary, what am I going to cover? I'm going to talk a bit about procurement options, so different ways to structure the project from a contractual standpoint. I'm going to touch on forms of building contract. I'm going to talk a bit about the professional team and also thinking about how uh, members of the consultancy group are going to be appointed, important considerations there. Uh, and then Alex mentioned around funder requirements in, de in the development context. And a big part of that is in relation to the suite of construction documentation and thinking about the key risks there and how they're <clears throat> properly allocated. So I'll go through that and then finish off with a few conclusions and a few takeaways. Can I have the next slide, please? So first, if you could go back one, please, Elaine, that would be great. 
Thank you. So first thing to cover is procurement options. And when we're talking about procurement in the construction context, what we're really talking about is the allocation of risk and this sort of idea of the time, cost and quality triangle, if you like. So there are a number of different options available for how projects can be uh, structured from a procurement standpoint. I'm going to summarize quite briefly during this session uh, the kind of pros and cons, if you like, and the key characteristics of three of the three most popular forms of, of procurement. And those are traditional design and build and construction management. Can I have the next slide, please? So first up is traditional. I've got some, some structure diagrams to help to try and kind of illustrate um, the key elements of these different options. And I've also got some, some tables in a minute to look at pros and cons. Um, but just starting off with traditional, so pulling out the key points here. So you've got the employer at the top in the middle of this diagram who enters into a building contract with a single main contractor. And then the, the main contractor will manage the risk that they take on under that contract by subletting to a number of subcontractors. So the key kind of characteristic really of a traditional structure is in relation to responsibility for design. So this is sort of summarized in the, the cell at the top in the middle there. Um, so a pure traditional structure is whereby the employer retains all of the design responsibility. And by that, I mean that they don't try and push any responsibility for design onto the contractor. They keep it all on their side of the table, if you will. Um, and the way that they do that is by appointing professional consultants to carry out the design and manage the design for them. A slight variation on that theme is where is option two at the top there, where you get a sort of split design responsibility. And in that scenario, you will have uh, specific kind of discrete packages of work and design, which are included within the building contract and they're stated as being the contractor's responsibility and they're often referred to as CDPs or uh, contractor design portions. And in the context of a residential scheme, such as we're talking about today, uh, a typical CDP package might be something like the mechanical and the electrical engineering elements, um, which are, you know, may well be best, best managed by the contractor. So that's a common approach. I have the next slide, please. So, Summarizing some of the kind of pros and cons of traditional, I, I won't go through all of these, but you, you'll have a chance to look at them when, when you receive the slides um, following the session. But just to pick out the key point, really, the main thing with traditional is around quality. So because the client retains responsibility for design and lets the contracts with the professionals to carry out that design, there's much more flexibility for the client on, on the design element. So if they want to make changes or they want to have um, a real focus on design and real high level of control over it, then traditional is, is the best way to go. And that's the sort of perceived main benefit of a traditional approach. Can I have the next slide, please? So moving on from traditional to have a look at a design and build structure. Design and build is something which has become extremely popular over the last decade or so, probably more last 20 years. Uh, for a number of reasons, which I will touch on. In terms of this diagram compared to the last one, there's actually quite a lot of similarities in the sense that the employer enters into a building contract with a single main contractor who has a supply chain beneath them of subcontractors. But as you would expect, the clue is in the title, design and build. So in this scenario, the client is looking to transfer responsibility for design onto the contractor. And so this sort of the differences here are that the employer will appoint some designers to take the design up to a certain stage and then appoint the building contractor. Contractor will take on the design and will need to have their own um, team of design professionals to develop that design and finish it off. Can I have the next slide, please? So things to pick out here in terms of pros and cons on D and B. One of the big pluses and one of the reasons why design and build has become so popular is this idea of a one stop shop. So looking at the sort of top right hand cell on this page and the idea of single point responsibility. So the benefit for the client here is that the contractor is, in theory, at least responsible for everything, all of the design, all of the workmanship. 
So if there are any problems with the with the build in terms of defects, whether that's during the defects period or, or latent defects later on, the, the client has the comfort of knowing that it's going to be the contractor that's on the hook for that. As a flip side to that sort of kind of trade-off, if you will, against the single point responsibility is looking at the bottom right-hand corner of this slide, which is there's a, there's a sort of concept, an idea that the client relinquishes a certain amount of control over design and also quality. So it's more of an output-based approach whereby it's more of a high-level design. You hand it over the contractor and it's really down to them to, to finish off the detail. So if, if, if quality and control over quality and design is key, then DMB is perhaps not quite so ideal for, for a client in that situation. Have the next slide, please. So last of the three procurement structures I wanted to look at is um, construction management. And you'll notice that this one looks quite different to the previous two in the sense that there's no single main contractor. So this is a structure which is very popular with house builders for a number of reasons, which I'll come on to. Um, but rather than having a single main contractor, the employer will enter into a number of individual building contracts, essentially with trade contractors who are responsible for a specific package or a particular element of the works. So rather than have that single main contractor, you have individual trade contractors or subcontractors, if you like, as they were described on the previous slide. You still have appointments with designers and non-designers. So it's more of a traditional structure in that sense, thinking about who has design responsibility. And then you have this other role, which isn't mentioned on the previous two, which is a construction manager. So this is a consultant who's appointed to basically run the project in terms of organizing the trade contractors and making sure um, everything's coordinated properly in terms of the relationships between uh, the different packages. Can we have the next slide, please? So pros and cons of construction management, starting in the middle at the top there. One of the big attractions for a CM approach for clients is that you get quite a big saving because you're not paying the overhead and profit of a main contractor. Um, you're just you're bypassing that route and going straight to the supply chain. You're not paying OHMP on top of OHMP, and that can be quite a significant number. So that's attractive for clients um, for obvious reasons. On the downside with construction management, just picking out a couple of things in the bottom hand left side there, uh, bottom left hand side, program is more of a challenge because you haven't got a single main contractor who's on the hook for delivering the scheme by a particular date with all the consequences that come with not achieving that date. You don't have somebody that's on the hook to, to deliver it by that time frame. So you're managing multiple trade contractors, try and get them to deliver on time and that can be more challenging. Um, similarly, bottom cell in the middle there, there's less certainty on construction price. So because you've got these multiple packages, there's more scope for variations in cost. And so cost certainty isn't perceived to be as concrete from a client's point of view if you're using a construction management approach. Can I have the next slide, please? So once you've decided on your procurement structure, you need to think about which form of building contract you're going to use. And I wanted just to pull out uh, some key points on this subject. So industry standard forms of building contract are the normal starting point when you're thinking about which form of building contract to use. And there's a couple I wanted to mention here. So two in particular, JCT 2016 and NEC4. So these are two well-established tried and tested forms of contract. So JCT 2016 has been around for 90 odd years or since 1931, I think it is. Uh, NEC4 is a bit newer than that. It came around in 1993, very popular with central government, local authorities and so on. And it's, it's sort of grown in popularity off the back of that. But JCT is still sort of far and away the most widely used industry stand, standard form of contract. So things to note about these two, they're both generally speaking considered to be institutionally acceptable so that so banks will fund on them particularly JCT. Um, NEC4 is considered to be more administratively burdensome in the sense that the person who's running the contract the project manager has to issue a lot more pieces of paper essentially a lot more notices a lot more meetings a lot more processes to go through and so there is a perception that actually the client can end up paying more in consultants fees um, 
to somebody who's running an NEC4 contract as opposed to a JCT. So something to think about. Final point on building contracts. So there is a view, rightly or wrongly, that industry standard form contracts are favorable to contractors in some key areas. And so it's very common practice to have something called a schedule of amendments appended to a building contract to to change the, the, the terms and conditions back in favor of the client in some key areas and to make them more neutral. So that's something which firms of solicitors are typically appointed to produce. Um, and it's a very common thing to do in the market and it's something that we would recommend doing. Um, and contractors are familiar with it and, and funders would expect to see it as well. Can I have the next slide, please? So a few key points in relation to professional team and the consultants that you as a developer, landowner are going to be appointing to help um, get the scheme going and, and progress it and complete it. So you've got these two main categories of consultants that you'll be appointing, designers and non-designers and you know, typical roles that uh, you'd be looking to appoint are listed up on the slide there. I won't go through all of them, but one thing I wanted to pick out in particular is under the non the third point under the non-designers list, which is this um, role of the employer's agent or the contract administrator. So this is the term which is used within the building contracts to describe the person who's administering the building contract on behalf of the employer. And what we often find with small uh, kind of new entrants to the market in development is that they they see this as a role that they can kind of they can do themselves. Uh, look, they see it as a, as a cost saving to the overall project. Our view, or my view in particular, is that it's better to go external and appoint a consultant to carry out this role rather than try and do it yourself. And there's a couple of reasons for that. The first one is that if there's a dispute with the builder, the courts don't look kindly on situations where the client has administered the contract themselves because there's an obligation on the employer's agent or the contract administrator to act fairly and impartially. And if the client is performing that role themselves, whether they've been impartial or not, there's a quite a straightforward argument for the contractor to run to say, well, this person can't be acting impartially because they're, you know, they're acting in their own interests. So that's 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 something which courts don't look at favorably. And so it's a good reason why um, it's it's better to appoint appoint somebody external. Yes, it's additional cost to the contract, um, to the project, but in the scheme of things, it's relatively minor and, and can prevent serious problems from arising later on. And the other thing is it's actually more complicated than you might think to do it correctly, particularly in relation to um, administering payments and the consequences of getting that wrong can be quite significant. So better to have somebody external who has insurance um, behind them if, if anything goes wrong with that role. Last thing on this slide is around the form of the contract. So the appointments that you'll enter into, um, there are two options really, bespoke forms. So independently prepared um, novel forms of contract often prepared by firms of solicitors or industry standard forms, a bit like building contracts. There are organizations like the RIBA, RICS and ACE that have um, industry standard forms of appointment. I would say this wouldn't I, but um, we would always recommend going for the bespoke option because it just puts the client in a much more robust position in a number of key areas in relation to that client uh, consultant relationship. Can I have the next slide please? So looking at funder requirements in relation to the construction suite of documentation and just pulling out some key points here. So first thing is that funders will expect the documentation to be what they refer to as institutionally acceptable. So they want it to be robust and there's an established approach in the market for how these documents should look, what they should contain, the obligations that they need to cover. Um, and if you don't have that set out properly, then the, the, it will come out in the wash during the funder's due diligence and it can cause problems if it's not addressed at an early stage. So in terms of the building contract, what does that mean? Well, it means you should be using an industry standard form of contract like the ones that I've talked about with a schedule of amendments to try and improve that risk profile in favor of the client and by extension in favor of the funder. We just talked about appointments and I said, it's better to go for a bespoke option because funders will be much more comfortable with that and it will massively streamline the process of the funder going through the documentation and approving it through their 
due diligence exercise. So key risk considerations from the funder's point of view. I won't go through all of these um, in the time available, but just to pick out some key points. So first thing is limits on liability. This is something which funders and their monitoring surveyors always look at very closely. Just to give you an extreme example, it's not going to be appropriate on, for, on a five million pound construction cost of a resi scheme for the architect to have a limit on their liability of half a million pounds. So that is something which if a you know, funder will look at that and say, this is not in line with the normal market position, that poses a risk to us because we're lending on the scheme. If we have to step in and take over and the architect is negligent and there's a big issue, we're only going to be able to recover up to that half a million pounds. So limits on liability are fine in principle, but they have to be thought about carefully and set at the right level relative to the overall construction cost. Next thing to mention, PI insurance. So. <laughs> Everybody, almost without exceptions, PI uh, premiums have gone up substantially over the course of the last few years for a whole number of reasons. But this is a, you know, it's really important that people who are parties who are responsible for design on a construction project have PI insurance sitting behind them. So making sure that covers in place at the right level is really important. Final thing to mention on this slide is the last point: collateral warranties with step-in rights. This is absolutely fundamental from a funder's point of view. So. If you haven't come across collateral warranties before, they're effectively sort of mini side agreements, if you like, between the funder and the individual members of the development team, whether it's contractor, consultant, subcontractors, and they're necessary to create a direct contractual link. So to give the funder recourse to those parties in the event that there's defects that come out in the works at some stage and the, fund and the borrower is no longer around. And linked to that is this idea of step in rights. So if the borrower defaults or goes into insolvency before the construction phase is finished, the funder will want the ability to step into the shoes of the borrower or place their nominee in that, in, in that position in order to complete the scheme and continue engaging with the contractors to realise the funder's security. So step-in rights are conferred through the collateral warranties. There's no implied obligation on contractors to give these warranties, so you have to set it out in the forms of the contract. That's absolutely key. OK, next slide, please. So just to wrap up and a few points by way of conclusion. So think about risk allocation and, and the procurement structure early on in the, in the piece. You need to choose appropriate and robust forms of contract for all the reasons that I talk about. And really important to think about funder requirements early, in particular with, with new or more inexperienced developer or development clients. We often see a scenario where they sort of leave it and hope for the best, leave it to the last minute on the basis that perhaps they didn't want to incur the legal cost of dealing with those contracts or have to you know, worry about it early on. But you know, leaving it as a hostage to fortune can cause real problems later on because all the time that goes on through the development process, you're undermining your bargaining position in terms of trying to agree those contracts with the, with the development parties. So do it early and, and it just makes everything much more streamlined. Okay, that's the end of my session and I will now hand you back to Jeremy for a few points by way of um, conclusion and to chair the Q&A. Thank you, Stefan. Um, and thank you all, all the speakers. Uh, thank you, Tom, Alison and Alex. Um, really interesting discussion, really interesting points you're making. Um, I'm sure, well, actually, indeed, I know there are webinars on each of those subjects which could endure for days probably. Um, and I'm very thankful that you've condensed them all into um, a very brief hour. Um, clearly, uh, development is not for the faint or indeed weak hearted. Um, and it takes a detailed approach uh, and, uh, and a very careful control of the risks. Um, you know where the legal and uh, design and surveying advice is um, and again thank you for our speakers for providing their time and input on that front um, we've got time for a few questions i know that probably some of them um, uh, you will need to um, go but we will be sending out the slides um, and a recording if you want it um, later so if you do have to go thank you very much and um, we will hopefully uh, hear from you soon We'll endeavour to answer all the questions. Um, however, if we can't, again, 
I, I will make sure they go to the relevant person and hopefully they will make contact with you to uh, respond to your query. Uh, to kick off on the questions, um, very topical and uh, directed towards Tom and Alison. Um, it's a question about the Queen's speech and um, the likelihood of that affecting planning permission. Any takers? Um, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll kick off on that if you like. Um, as Jeremy said, the planning, I'm sure Alison and I could probably do a two day seminar on planning your own development. So uh, if anyone's got any specific questions, then by all means, contact us afterwards. Um, as I alluded to at the beginning and Alison mentioned as well, last summer, the government introduced the planning white paper, which was a, a wholesale review of the, um, the planning system, um, very heavily focused on house building and delivery of housing. and um, over the course of the last nine months or so, there has been a lot of fuss about it. A lot of people um, do not like um, many of the ideas that have been put forward. I think some of them are quite sensible and some of them are, are, are frankly not. Um, and there's a lot of speculation as to what might happen in the Queen's speech. Ultimately, it was a very short Queen's speech for all sorts of reasons, not least COVID. And there were some guidance notes that were produced subsequently and haven't really made it into the mainstream press yet. But as we understand it, the government appears to be going full steam ahead with the proposals that were in the planning white paper. What that means, um, there are a few points to make really. Firstly, it is going to take a long time to come through. The government are trying to rush this through as quick as they possibly can. But the reality of when these provisions will kick in and how long local authorities are going to have to take to to, to, to gear up to what is a, a very different method of plan making and a very different approach to uh, design and also the environment and also in relation to infrastructure provision. Um, I, I, think, I think it will be you know, years rather than months before the changes happen. But ultimately, in the, in the fullness of time, we may be in a position where most of the system is front loaded at the plan making stage. And so rather than there being such a heavy focus on making an application for planning permission and that planning being determined with public consultation at that stage, the focus is going to be more on getting sites allocated within a plan and effectively that's securing you a, a, a planning permission at that stage, give or take. A lot of the details have got to be hammered out yet and that's going to be difficult. The other thing to mention is in relation to infrastructure delivery. Um, the government quite likes using the phrase scrap section 106 and what they're proposing is a sort of a hybrid of the community infrastructure levy, a, a, a land tax or an uplift capture method um, and also um, a, a provision that will be uh, effectively paying for all of your infrastructure rather than having to enter into a section 106 agreement with the local authority. I think that is extremely ambitious. And um, I, my view is that is that Section 106 is useful for all sorts of reasons, none of which are covered in the white paper. So in short, um, it's difficult to say, but it's going to be a long road ahead. So I think we all press on as normal for, the, for at least the next probably 12 months or so. Alison, I don't know if you've got anything else you want to add to that. Yeah, thanks ever so much. So if I um, can just add a few points. Um, what has been in the press, um, particularly when the white paper came out last year, was this concept of zoning, which was introduced. And for us, um, there's, uh, well, protected areas were, were suggested. Um, and as Tom said, the detail is awaited. Um, but for us, that's, uh, we see that as obviously bad news for the countryside. So we have a campaign called the Rural Powerhouse Campaign, which is about unleashing the uh, uh, economic potential of the countryside um, through five elements, one of which is plan planning. And that is a significant uh, barrier which we see to the rural economy. So we have um, created a, a, a policy paper from the CLA in response to the planning white paper and its proposals uh, in conjunction with our rural powerhouse campaign and what we would like to be seeing to make sure that uh, the planning system works for urban and rural environments because really, uh, to, you know, to date, it just sort of focuses on the urban environments and just doesn't really uh, help the countryside areas at all. So, um, I mean, if that's helpful, I can certainly uh, send that through to, 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 to you guys at Burkitts for circulation if, if people would be interested in that paper. But um, yeah, that is something that um, we as the CLA are certainly um, concerned about. So we will be lobbying for in terms of the planning white paper and its proposals. Great.
great. Uh, th thank you both for that. Um, I'm going to then pose one to Alex, um, and probably quite a brief response, I expect. Um, in terms of interest rates um, currently seen in the market and loan to values, uh, can you give a brief idea of um, what sort of the range you're seeing? Yeah, it really depends on the lender. Um, so if you're going with a sort of mainstream bank, um, a high street lender, um, you might see sort of as little as sort of three percent. A lot of the alternative lenders are around the sort of six percent, going up to nine-ish sort of percent. Uh, and then if you if you've got a, a sort of what's considered quite a, a risky profile for your lend, you might see higher than that, so even up to something like fifteen. But that's more unusual. Um, on the loan to value side. Um, it, again, it really depends on the lend and how, how risky it's seen as being. Um, we sort of see around, generally around the sort of 65% mark. Um, you can see higher than that. You can see lower than that. Um, you know, I've seen as low as 50. Um, I've also seen as high as sort of 80 recently. So, um, but but so sort of 65, 70 is a, is a sort of fairly standard sort of level to see it at. Great, thank you. Um, Steph, I'm going to fire a double barrel question at you. Um, uh, what is the difference between an employer's agent and a contract administrator? Um, and does a JCT design a bill contract make the contractor responsible for the design, the whole of the design? Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, I'll take those in order. So, the difference between the employer's agent and the contract administrator, in practical terms, there isn't really a difference. It's just the terminology which is used as between the different forms of contracts. So, if you've got a JCT designer build, it will refer to that role as an employer's agent. And if it's a JCT standard building contract, which is a traditional form, it will refer to it as a contract administrator. And different contracts call it different things. NEC calls it the project manager. Um, so it uh, just depends, as I say, on the, the form that you're using. And then the second point, which was about JCT design and build and whether that's fully full design responsibility, the answer is no. So if you don't amend the JCT design and build contract, it doesn't make the contractor responsible for the whole of the design, which seems perverse, but it's true. So in a JCT DMB, you have something called the employer's requirements. And you have something called the contractor's proposals. And the employer's requirements are the employer's risk. And if there's any design in there, then it's the, uh, the, con the employer's risk. And the contractor's proposals is what the contractor takes responsibility for. So I talked about schedules of amendments. And that's that's one of the key things we change when we're doing a JCT is to make the contractor responsible for the whole design. And that's something that funders will be keen to see. Okay. Great. Um, thanks, Stefan. I think we've got time for a couple more. Um, and Alex, I'm going to find another quick one at you. Um, mm -hmm. And the question is, how do the financing options change for those looking to build out their own home rather than um, buying a sort of a ready built house? So self build and finance options um, compared to, I suppose, what would be a sort of standard mortgage. Um, well, um, a lot of lenders, so a lot of high street normal mortgage providers uh, won't uh, lend uh, for self-builds. So you will need to go to a specialist lender who is prepared to do that type of lending. Um, and I think that's the main difference. And because you have to go to a lender and often um, bridge lenders as well, it just is more expensive. That's the main, main difference. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and certainly on the self-build front, um, uh, we, we see a lot more input um, requirement in terms of understanding the development because the self-build is very often part of a much larger area of land which has got planning permission. So just a, a sort of practical points in terms of the due diligence we have to go through um, when dealing with that kind of um, uh, mortgage or funding uh, it can be a lot more complex um than a sort of standard house build or house buy yeah. um, 
certainly you know if it's if it's you on your own um doing a self build for your first time and you've got no experience uh in that that will be seen as a sort of more risky profile than somebody who is a regular developer and that will also affect the options available to you and who will be prepared to lend could I just briefly add to the self-build uh, point, just, just to flag, um, that we've been made aware that Richard uh, Bacon MP has um, been asked by the PM to uh, undertake a review into custom self-build with a view to getting numbers up. So that uh, I think that review is uh, due out in July. So just a bit point of interest there if you're interested in self-build. Good. Um, thank you, Alison. Uh, I've actually got the final question for you, um, unless we have another one. Um, is uh, you mentioned material planning considerations. Um, can you expand on that a bit? Please? Yeah, absolutely. So um, material planning considerations, um, it's sort of, uh, th there's no definition in planning le legislation for them. So um, it's uh, really anything uh, which um, serves or, or relates to the purpose of uh, planning. So i.e. to, uh, th th that relates to the development. So there are some sort of statutory ones, for example, the local plan, uh, MPPF, neighbourhood plans, uh, designations, uh, listed buildings, habitat protection, things like that. But also um, there can be other elements. So, for example, flood risk, uh, nuisances, so noise, dust, fumes coming from a development, things like that. Um, the affordable housing requirement with a housing needs assessment to support that. So it, it, it can be a whole range of things. It just depends on the proposal um, and the, the, the sort of specifics of it. Um, but yeah, th there's no sort of um, clear definition for it, um, unfortunately, but that gives a flavour as to what they might include. Thank you very much. Um, I think on that note, uh, we'll, we'll wind up. Um, I'd like to thank each of uh, our speakers today. So, uh, Alison, a special thanks to you for joining us from the CLA. Alex, Tom, Stefan, all very interesting. Um, and as I said, I'm sure we could listen to you for days, but unfortunately, we're going to have to forgo that pleasure at this time. Um, the, uh, there is a feedback form coming out. Um, please do fill it in um, and do uh, follow up with any questions you have. Um, you know where to find us all. Um, and if you don't, um, send an email and we'll uh, make sure uh, it finds a home. Um, I'd also just to, like a quick thanks to um, Elaine and her team at Burkitts for setting all this up. A lot of effort goes into it um, and we really appreciate it. Um, on that note, hopefully there's a generation of landowners out there who will then be developers and builders. Um, you know where to find us if we can help. Um, but good luck, um, and it's all about attention to detail. Uh, thank you very much.